And every time I press live now, I lose all my windows. <laughs> Thanks for joining us once again. I'm Sammy K. Powers, and this is the PHP Roundtable. This is a live podcast of developers discussing topics that PHP nerds care about. And the ultimate goal of this uh, podcast is to learn a little something from each other. And if you're listening live want to be a part of the show, send a tweet to PHP Roundtable or, um, or me, Sammy K. Well, actually, just send it to PHP Roundtable. That'll be easier to monitor <laughs> uh, with a question. And we'll try to get your question answered or your comment addressed uh, if we can. The PHP fig! That's the thing that Phil Sturgeon came up with, right? Well, that's not actually true, but uh, a lot of people tend to think that. In fact, there's a lot of misnomers about what the fig is and where it came from. Today, we're, chat we're chatting with a panel of PHP fig members, both past and present, who are going to help us better understand where the organization came from, what purpose it serves today, and where it could lead in the future, where it's going. So we have a ton of people on the panel today. Lots of Fig members. Seven, seven, eight. I think nine. I don't know. There's a lot of them. But we're gonna we're gonna go through all these intros real quick. Um, first off, in no particular order, we got Cal Evans. He's the artist formerly known as the community representative of the Fig. So welcome, Cal. Glad to be here. Thank you. We also have Paul Jones, who's the Fig project representative for Aura Project and Solar Framework. Welcome, Paul. Hello. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Paul Dragunas. So we got two Pauls. Paul Dragunas is the FIG project representative for the PPI framework. Welcome, Paul. Hi. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Chris Tankersley, Dragon Man Tank on Twitter, is the FIG project representative representative for Sculpin. Welcome, Chris. Hello. And Matthew Wiro Fenny, who is the man. He's MWAP on Twitter. He's the FIG project representative for Zen Framework. Welcome, Matthew. Greetings, everyone. And we got Everett Pott, who um, was a former uh, developer shout-out, and so was Chris uh, Paul Dragunas. Actually, I think several of you guys were, or <laughs> Matthew was, I think, at one point. Lots of developer shout-outs from the past here who are joining us today. But Everett is a FIG project representative and for the uh, Saber Dev framework. I, did I say that right, Everett? Yeah, Saber Dev, pretty close. Um, yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me. Absolutely. And Michael Cullum, he's the British guy. He's the oldest FIG secretary. Welcome, Michael. Hello. And finally, we got the newest FIG secretary, Samantha Quinones. Welcome, Samantha. Hi. It's great to be here. So that's a lot of FIG members. This is like FIG-tastical. I, th I feel like I'm sitting under a FIG tree. <laughs> oh, gosh. So many okay, don't worry. The puns will, will keep going. <laughs> I see the class. <laughs> There's a fair joke in there someplace, too. So. <laughs> So the PHP fig. All right, before we before we jump into the PHP fig, let's get the pre-fig PHP zeitgeist. Like, what did the landscape of PHP look like before there was this little organization called the fig? Does anyone want to take that on? It was a horrible dark landscape. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, That's a long time you, you were creating frameworks back in Zen Frame, uh, back before fig. Mm -hmm. Tell us what it was like. Well, frameworks were one of the big things that changed the landscape because before that we just didn't even have, you know, there was the complete wild west. You might use some pair packages, you might use some PHP classes packages, you might re get random stuff off of the uh, internet uh, office searches and stuff. Uh, the frameworks started introducing standards and um, you know, getting some idea of what code might look like and how uh, things might work. Uh, and then the uh, fig group came along because then we were all of us frameworks doing things completely differently, of course, uh, and realized that that wasn't exactly making it easy to jump ship between uh, frameworks or to interoperate uh, in places where we might want to use a component from one to the other. So uh, that was kind of the stage at the time. Uh, that was back in 2009, I believe, was when we had the first meeting that uh, started the FIG group. Uh, so uh, you know, we'd had a few years of frameworks under our belts, uh, and we were just starting to see the pains of uh, everybody doing those differently as well. Although, in fairness, it might be, uh, to refine that point, uh, there were lots of projects out there. Each project had its own set of standards, its own way of doing things. Uh, Horde and Pair were uh, two examples of that, where you had lots of different people coming together, Pair especially, lots of different people coming together under the banner of one project and submitting themselves to its rules and its standards but of course, that only applied within that project. You have another project, you've got a different set of rules and standards to, to, uh, to abide by. 
So what kind and of specific... also a lot of us were using the pair standards, for instance, but uh, things like autoloaders were so uh, new at the time that there was no uh, cooperation between those, which meant everybody was registering their own. And when you have an autoloader stack, that actually becomes a performance issue as well, which was what prompted the very first uh, standards that we were looking at, which became PSR0. So basically, there were standards at the time, but they were kind of framework specific? Typically, yes. The, the old joke being, the standards are great, just pick which one you're going to follow. Right. <laughs> was there an actual organization that was set out to be a standards body in PHP before that, or was it all just specifically frameworks? Was there any attempt to do any Same kind of thing like that? Uh, Pair. No, I'm sorry? Pair was like the closest. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Pair was the closest uh, thing to official PHP that we had at the time, considering, you know, you had Pair, you had Peckle, you had PHP, so Pair was one thing but uh, it didn't cover everything. Like Matthew said, autoloading was a new thing, and Pair didn't really keep up with what was happening in PHP, so that came for the point to create something that was that was relevant. So Pair was really just a coding standard, right? Like it was just PSR1 and PSR2, and that was it? Or did they have other standards? No, Pair had a whole body of standards associated with it. Sorry about that. Um, it, it, there was a coding style guide. There was a way to raise errors. It was additionally a, a repository of, of different libraries. It was, um, I think I've said elsewhere, and we may get to this later, Pair was a monolithic version of what we have now. It was the standards, the packaging system, the actual packages, and everything else uh, sort of all wrapped into one. Yeah. And it's interesting because also, you know, Pair was going to be the, the way for PS, the PHP projects itself to actually ship PHP code. And um, so, um, yeah, it was, an, it was an interesting time. We, and I do feel we lost something when losing Pair, unfortunately. But, uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people just, uh, and also if you think of uh, PSR0, uh, it wasn't so much that, you know, there was um, nobody knew how to do this and let's come up with a completely new thing. It was PSR0 our, our was really to write down what Pair was doing and um, the example Pair and Hort set and other people wanted to follow. So in, in that sense, PSR0 was a way to formalize that for everybody. And I think even at the time, there were some people that kind of said, well, okay, now we've done PSR0, let's just disband this group now because we're done. And uh, yeah, that's at least that's what I vaguely remember from back in the day. So did, it wasn't did, quite like that because you know, we... Uh, it, we disbanded, I, I would argue, more because of the community backlash at the time. We, you know, we went and uh, said, you know, hey, this was really cool that we met, uh, and then I uh, thought, hey, let's get a mailing list, and David Kualier was like, hey, you know, why don't we just, you know, set it up as PHP standards on uh, uh, the the PHP list server, and that was uh, ugly. Let me just put the it conflagration ensued yeah. thereafter. So that, that was, I think, tended to die down right afterwards was uh, mainly there was so much backlash against it. You know, we formalized PSR0, uh, but and we didn't even call it a PSR0 at the time. It was just an auto-loading standard. Um, but, yeah, there was so much backlash against people for, oh, how can how dare you dictate standards under the PHP, uh, you know, namespace and everything. And we're like, whoa, whoa, that wasn't the intention. And, uh, you know, we basically uh, uh, banished ourselves from the, the PHP listserv and then had to try and try and find a new home, and that didn't happen for a year or two. So I had a, quite a look at this um, quite recently, having a look at the old mailing list, which is actually a really interesting thing to do if you find yourself with a uh, spare 15 minutes. And it initially started with um, them wanting the mailing list to be completely closed, and just the people um, who had been in that initial fig meeting at Tech um, to be able to post to that mailing list. So it was a bunch of people saying, like, li literally, this is, just wants to be a place for those projects to discuss between themselves, and it wasn't a thing for the wider PHP community, which is something I suspect we'll come on to later on. Um, but initially, it was just that it was the mailing list was for the people who were at that um, initial tech meeting to discuss um, the PSR zero standard. Um, and then a whole bunch of people said, um, including Rasmus, Rasmus jumped in uh, on there and said, if you're going to have a mailing list on php.net, then it has to be open. Um, and then they moved to Google Groups, but they still remained open, an open mailing list. So. Well, Michael, you're you're actually a, um, a secretary of the FIG, which is sort of a new role, right? And so is Samantha. What, what, is, what is a secretary? Why, why is there a secretary role? Um, you're muted. So, oh, yeah, you sorry. Um, 
So uh, throughout the past few years, there's been a lot of uh, admin tasks, um, things that have fallen by the wayside, um, whether that's things like updating the website and who is responsible for things like permissions on GitHub, um, running the Twitter account. Um, in addition to the sort of vo ongoing voting tracking and things like that, we've not had any specific person to kind of handle that role. And different people have, have done different parts of that before. So I used to do um, keep a huge spreadsheet which had um, vote tracking on it. Um, Phil used to do a lot of lot of stuff with the website, um, which a lot of people know about. Um, but essentially, the idea was is that um, I think it came up initially at Zencon. We said, said let's formalise this role, have some three elected representatives. Um, who can go and do this stuff. They can do developer advocacy on behalf of the FIG. Um, they can go and tell people how awesome the FIG is. Um, they can um, also work together to sort of moderate things. Um, they can do things like uh, manage the Twitter accounts um, and the general admin that go, goes on within the FIG. Yeah. So is the it seems like so the the fig is just like it sounds like very like a political organization you got members that are voted in and you got like nominations and all that kind of stuff so and the, I guess the more people that you get into the fig the more I guess political or, or or architected it becomes which I guess you is one of the reasons why you have maybe we'll see more more roles show up as big as as it gets bigger or is there is there any attempt to kind of yeah. like keep it a certain size or I don't know if that's really the case, but it's 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 a good idea, or at least seems to be a good idea to, to sort of separate that administrative functions from, um, you know, the people who are actually uh, writing the standards and voting on them and discussing them. Like it's it's two different. It's really two different jobs. Right. Well, yeah, by so, the way, go ahead. So by any means, sorry. Uh, so by any means, we're not leaders of the fig, and we're not people to. Um, come and tell people what to do. Um, our job is simply to give people the resources and make sure that the fig runs smoothly um, and to be sort of like go-to people. If people um, want to communicate with the fig, then they can come and, you know, they don't want to send a message to the mailing list. They can have a chat with us um, and we can do that. We can go to conferences. We can give talks about the fig. Um, past couple of conferences that me, Samantha, and Joe have been up to, um, we've had God knows how many people just coming up to us asking us about fig stuff um, because it's suddenly like the fig now has people that you can go and speak to that are not the 40 people who are, you know, PHUV, Drupal, Joomla, um, Zenfray Work Symphony representatives, but actually people there to represent the fig. Um, cool. And when we brought it up at ZenCon, uh, it was, we were. I think all on the same page that we wanted to make sure that secretaries had no skin in the game from a voting standpoint. Right. So getting an outside perspective on, you know, when they do things, it's not because they're uh, interested, their their project's interests aren't at heart. It's someone who just wants to help, you know, with the administrative functions and things like that. Well, and in fairness, any of the, anyone can come to any FIG member at any time they want. They're, as individuals, it's, it's not as if the secretary is a defined role as the interface to everyone else. The secretary is uh, uh, almost entirely an internal position. Uh, it, you know, and, and of course, secretaries can talk as individuals as they want, but as you know, as secretaries, it's it's not as if they're the face of Fig. You know, everyone that's involved is the face of Fig. So. Cool. And there's a lot of faces of Fig, um, and, and <laughs> which is really cool. It's just it's cool to see so many P community members um, to get involved with this. But um, I wanted to kind of look at some of these PSR, the the PHP standard recommendations. Um, and some people maybe listening might be familiar with maybe PSR two, which is a coding standard, to make sure that your curly brackets are are just right, or uh, maybe they're familiar with the auto loading standard PSR four. But um, I don't know. They might not know about. Um, there's one. There's even a PSR 13 out there that's kind of in, under the works. So um, I kind of want to ro roll through some of these pretty quickly. But before we do, um, what is the process that a PSR takes in order to get to the official? Like this is a PSR. This is standard. This is official. So initially, um, we used to have the problem where a um, someone could throw an idea on the mailing list, and they would say, "Look, I've got this idea for." Um, a PSR to do with how to use inline JavaScript in PHP. Um, and then suddenly it would be a case of, oh, look, the figure's talking about doing this, when ultimately that's just some person talking about it. Um, we also had the problem with uh, PSR 6, which is quite famous for this, in that it was lots of simultaneous ideas um, were 
um, people came up with lots of different competing proposals. Um, and as a result, I think PSR 6, which is the caching interface, um, it took something four, four and a half years, I think, um, in total. Permanently long. Yeah. Um, so uh, Phil Sturgeon um, worked quite heavily on creating a workflow bylaw. Um, and the idea of that is that it goes through a series of stages and there is um, a, the final acceptance vote, which is probably the most important one. This is to say this is a finalized standard, which isn't going to be changed anymore. Um, this is uh, something that the FIG says is a, is a valid standard. Um, but we also now have an entrance vote. Um, and the thing about an entrance vote is this is essentially saying this is a problem that we, the FIG is working on. Um, and after it's gone to an entrance vote, it gets assigned a number. So PSR 13, for example. Um, and the, um, then it goes into a draft stage, at which point it's worked upon. Um, and that's kind of like the core bit. And then you have a two, and then you have a review stage, which is where it's not changing um, significantly, but typos can be fixed and people can have a look over it. Um, because, for example, PSR three, when um, that initially came out, it was kind of a Jordy said on the mailing list, "Hey, let's have a logging PSR." People went, "Yeah, it sounds like a good idea." And then Jordy said, "Well, here's a logging PSR." Um, and then it was voted through. So there wasn't. It, it slows things down, but so that it can have adequate, adequate, no, adequate review. Um, and people can actually share their opinions whilst it's being developed as opposed to just having this suddenly finalized specification popping out of nowhere. Yeah, slow is definitely not a bad thing. The process can be very important. So there's a slightly different perspective on that, having been there at the, the founding of the thing and having produced PSR, having been the, the person uh, leading the charge on PSRs both before and after the bylaw got put in place. Uh, before it was put in place, uh, there was no formal mechanism other than saying, uh, you know, I'm a FIG member, uh, here is a proposal, uh, or, you know, I'm, I, I have an interest in what's going on here, here's a proposal. And then, like, like uh, Michael said, you can work on it back and forth, back and forth, and everyone puts forth their idea on it. Um, the, the reason that PSR, that uh, the bylaw got put in place, was, it happened, well, the, the reason for it came out of PSR 4 where Phil Sturgeon, after having uh, modified the document that was being voted on and then me having to cancel the vote, uh, and then the resulting discussions after that, Phil got tired of everyone uh, trying to change the thing in process. Uh, and so the bylaw came into place to say, here are the defined stages of the process. Uh, so I will, I will argue that uh, what, was happening, what has happened with the bylaw is that it's just formalized what was kind of already going on beforehand, uh, and as uh, Samantha and Michael have already said, putting in defined stages of time so that we are we now formally say there is a certain amount of time that there has to be for a review. There is a certain amount of time that has to pass before a draft. Um, in my experience, things taking too long has not act or things going too quickly has never actually been a problem. Uh, every single one of the PSRs has dragged on for months and months and months. <laughs> Which isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Like trying to get, trying to nail down something specific that everybody can agree on, but that's that can be really hard, especially with. I know they were struggling with. Um, well, this is on Paul Drag. Paul Drag Gunis, you worked on this one, uh, the PSR six, right? Um, the caching interface. Um, that one was hey. that one was a tough one to tackle, right? <laughs> yeah, tough, sir. Uh, interesting one to use, I guess. I worked on it for four years, though, from day one till till it finally turned out effectively. Um, but uh, yeah, I went through many stages and it was depressing. Things, yeah, like Evert and myself, we came together and there was a few other competings and throughout the different throughout the timeline of that progressing, either you know going forward and then a bit back. Uh, you know, I was doing the I was doing the editing and then I was doing the the development, the contributions, and then I was in the coordination, and that's going back and forth. This is before we had like rules. You know, we had like an, an assigned person, uh, like a coordinator or an editor, that came after. Um, so I ended up just becoming coordinator for that. But um, in hindsight, I think that if some problems, if there's you're trying to solve a problem, that's a good that's a good initiative. But and yeah, in hindsight, the, the PSR sex, the caching stuff. If a problem seems that hard to standardize, then maybe it should, shouldn't be standardized. Um, that's one opinion, that's one approach to it. Of course, you know, it would be nice to have some consistency for caching, but um, there are, I, th I see 
I personally agree with on both sides of the fence that there should and shouldn't be a PSR six for the, the, the for the reasons given given for that. But by but by the time it was like four years down the line and we were rounded round in circles about hundred times, um, I said, you know what, what we have right now is what we have right now, and we just have to ship it and just put a stamp on it and say enough's enough. And if we want to make a revised version later on, uh, we can do that. But this we have to just put an end to this and and agree with what we have now and agree agree to disagree to that in the future that we could have a, a revised version or a better version that solves it in a more a better way with the hindsight the be, having the benefit of having hindsight to look back upon it. I hope that's that a, makes that's sense. A question that's kind of come up a lot lately about like in general for like readdr readdressing uh, existing PSRs and editing them and extending them and I mean it's something that, that we seem to be talking a lot about. Yeah, and you know what? I, I kind of think um, that's actually a great example of where this, you know, the process, even if it was informal, um, first, I think it's kind of like it hasn't served us really well. I honestly believe that um, I think the entire process is kind of built to, um, um, to kind of facilitate, like, creating this perfect standard every time and not actually accept it as a, as a PSR, PSR until that's the case. And obviously, nothing's ever going to be perfect. And in the case of PSR 6, it actually ended up being so controversial that I think it only barely actually made it through the votes. And um, and I think some of the people who voted for it simply wanted to, it to be over. Um, and um, and I think that's, that's that sucks. I think if we, maybe in year one or year two, if we had just kind of put it up for a vote and accepted it and then, you know, create a few more PSRs later and people can start to actually use and practice, hate it, and then come together and make something better, I think that's a much better better way to deal with some of these things. Well, I think that was one of the things that uh, I discussed with uh, Larry a little bit at uh, Midwest PHP last week. One of the reasons I think PSR 7 succeeded uh, at a certain level was that there were several of us actually building the library and trying to consume it uh, so we could see what the problems were. Uh, I don't think enough people actually built anything around PSR 6 to see what the problems were, and the few that were trying it uh, for some reason, their voices got drowned out uh, in the discussion. It felt like, uh, but uh, I, I like the approach of you know we build something with it and see if it works, and then standardize on that. And in some cases, you know we're actually trying to standardize on something we're already doing, which is even better. That's easy, yeah. right? That's what Mog was. Um, but uh, without that, uh, you know, it's it's hard to have a standard. And then if we do standardize something that nobody's built on, then of course we're going to have to revisit later down the line, no matter what. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, IETF actually um, uh, makes uh, um, uh, writers of you know the, the RFCs to have at least two working uh, implementations, mm -hmm. and not just you know some something that's kind of chugging along and is a, as a test, but actually something that is in production um, to uh, b before they allow these things to become standards. And you know maybe that's also maybe how PSR should work is that you actually make that the one requirement, have at least two people interoperable with each other, and that's maybe enough to actually build a standard. Mm -hmm. And if that means that you know ten other people don't agree with that one, that's okay. Let them make another PSR. That you know, um, I think if we kind of go more into this different form where we just allow people to come together in this group, the PHP fig and just create something together quickly and uh, standardize on something and then move on. I think um, the group can be so much stronger. So um, at the moment, uh, there are quite a lot of... Uh, Fig had a, a kind of identity crisis, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, towards the end of last year, um, and is still currently going through this now. Um, and Larry um, and myself are currently working on um, a restructure bylaw um, to do with the new sort of structure of the fig that might potentially um, become the new fig, essentially. And uh, one of the parts of that um, that was included, actually, was that the review stage um, would include that specific thing. Um, so there would have to be two working implementations. Um, there were some problems with PSR6 um, that a couple of people pointed out um, sort of a couple of weeks after PSR6 had gone through um, as people were starting to create implementations of it. And those are, those are the kinds of things which really should be picked up in review. Um, and if they had been picked up in review, then things might have been done about it. Um, so the idea of having two implementations before it gets finalized um, is definitely something that's been worked into that, because that's um, it, it will help pick up problems, and you know we want to learn from our mistakes, right? Um, 
So, yeah. Um, just to clarify earlier, um, some terms that Paul used. Um, an editor is a person who kind of guides a um, PSR through, um, and the coordinator and sponsor are two voting members um, who are kind of saying that um, it, you need a coordinator and a sponsor. A coordinator handles all of the votes, and a sponsor is to ensure um, that it has adequate support from the FIG before it goes to entrance votes and the like. Um, just clear those terms up for anyone who was uh, not clear on those. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that because I, I was actually uh, going to ask that. <laughs> like, what are Because the, on every proposal uh, or every uh, PSR, it, it does have three people on it: the editor, the coordinator, and the sponsor. And I was always curious about how that would that actually played out uh, specifically. But um, speaking of like revising um, accepted PSRs, getting a little bit of an echo here. I think. Hold on just a second. I think it might be you, Matthew. Let me just try that. Okay, the echo is gone. All right, cool. Sorry, Matthew. You can unmute yourself whenever you're ready to talk. <laughs> so um, I was wanting to look at the. Um, uh, there's a. I believe this is a new status for PSRs. Is the deprecation status, the deprecated status, and there is one official deprecated uh, PSR, PSR zero. Um, when did the deprecation status uh, make its way in there, and what, why did we deprecate PSR zero? That happened shortly after PSR four passed. Uh, PSR four is the first of the. I have to reveal that I'm the, I'm the, the, I was the lead on that one. Uh, PSR 4 was the first uh, sort of revised standard to come in place. We had originally had PSR 0, which, uh, and Matthew will correct me on this if I get anything wrong, because he was essentially in charge of running PSR 0. Uh, Autoloader standard that was transitional. Uh, we had just come over to PHP 5.3, and so we had to support both the old pseudo namespaces of underscores and the formal namespaces of 5.3. Uh, and then as, you know, as things moved along in the PHP world, uh, we decided, it, it occurred to several people, among them me, that a, uh, a, an ex a different way of doing autoloading that refined that was, uh, would be useful. And, so, and that, was PS, that refined version is PSR4. Uh, once that went, went into place, uh, several people thought uh, that maybe PSR0 should no longer be recommended as the way of doing things. So we didn't want to get rid of it, uh, but the idea was, you know, we'll leave it in place, but we'll point out there is this other thing, PSR4. As a result, PSR0 uh, was deprecated. Uh, I don't think we have any other deprecated PSRs at this point, mostly because there haven't been any other PSRs that have uh, revised and refined previous ones aside from PSR4. So PSR12 um, will be um, a PSR that will uh, deprecate PSR2. Um, so that would be the next one. Uh, the other kind of new step that we're looking at introducing is um, an abandoned PSR state. Um, and the reason for an abandoned PSR state is kind of if it starts being worked on by a working group, but then um, the original working group might lose interest. Um, so for example, we've got PSR5 at the moment, um, and Mike, uh, who is an amazing guy, um, is currently, going, is currently um, uh, on sabbatical from the FIG. Um, and both the coordinator and the um, sponsor, I, who I believe were Phil and Cal, um, have now left the fig and therefore it is uh, working groupless. Um, so unless we can find people who want, are willing to step into those roles, then um, essentially that's not being worked on, so we will take it out of a draft PSR um, because it's not being drafted. Um, and similar things might happen for 9 and 10 if we don't find an end for them in the near future as well. So P to clarify, PS PSR5 is the PHP doc standard, right? Dot blocks. Uh, right. And then so PSR9 and 10 are actually pretty important because those are the security-related PSRs, um, specifically uh, PSR9 being the security disclosure and PSR10 being security advisory. Um, what is the difference between the, the disclosure and advisory um, PSRs? So disclosure is um, about once you've found a vulnerability and you're telling the world about it. Um, so the idea is that allows automated tools that can kind of check your website and sort of see if um, you, know, you might be using vulnerable versions, um, providing a way for people to find out about vulnerabilities that have been disclosed. Um, security reporting process is all about when you found a security vulnerability in, um, say, Zen Framework or Drupal or Joomla or the like. Um, and it's things like uh, don't have a contact form on your Drupal website to report Drupal vulnerabilities because um, 
in doing so, you know, there might be a vulnerability um, as that they can actually stop that form from letting you know about the vulnerability and things like that. Um, but it also covers things like uh, responsible disclosure. Um, and it's, it's all about having a kind of like an agreement between the security researchers and the different projects. Um, so, you know, if a project might say, well, we don't respond to your security um, report within 60 days and we don't patch it within 90, um, then you are very welcome to disclose it to the public kind of thing. And then they've kind of they've put their, their stamp and they've kind of agreed that they'll, that'll, that is what they will do. Cool. We've almost mentioned actually all the PSRs. Uh, <laughs> there's only a couple that we haven't t uh, talked about. Um, one, actually, we had an entire episode, episode 22. We talked all about PSR 7 with uh, Matthew Weir, Finney, Finney and a couple others. Because, Matthew, you were, you were the editor on PSR 7, is that right? Yep. And then Larry Garfield, and who else was on PSR 7? Uh, Avert wasn't a sponsor, but he was a contributor. Uh, oh, um, it was um, Bo Simonson. Uh, he, was oh, a, cool. he was the uh, representative for Sculpin at the time. Yeah, cool. And I believe Everett Pot was the uh, official developer shout-out for that episode uh, yep. 22. Because <laughs> he also played a role in PSR 2. Or, I'm sorry, PSR 7, I'm saying 2. <laughs> yeah, huge role. That was awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but we haven't mentioned PSR 8. What the heck is PSR 8? It's the huggable interface? Is that a joke, or is that a for real thing? It's completely real. It's totally incredibly real. Serious. It's incredibly serious. I, th I think Hal should explain this one. Um, I will do so um, only because it was Larry's idea and he's not here. Um, I be, and I was actually one of the sponsors of this PSR, uh, mainly because Larry knows that I drink on Friday nights and he sent it to me late one Friday night and said, hey, you want to do this? So um, we're, we're going to blame Sailor Jerry for the PSR, for uh, for this PSR. But it is it is implemented at every, or we've got um, implementations at every conference that Larry's at. Uh, my favorite is, and there's actually a picture of it somewhere, um, PHP Bulgaria, where we had this huge freaking group hug, and somebody had a selfie stick doing this number on it, and got a picture of all of us doing it. It was an April Fool's joke. Um, I honestly hope we ratify it, just because I think that all April Fool's jokes need to be taken way too far, and that would be, so... <laughs> So are we going to are we going to delete it? Are we going to mark it as abandoned, or is somebody going to create a silly library for it and then confuse people even further? So it's kind of a tough one because in terms of if you look at the fig, um, a lot of people consider the fig to uh, be a laughing stock for a lot of different reasons. And the thing with PSR8 um, is that it's kind of we're kind of making ourselves a laughing stock on purpose. Um, and I've heard a variety of different views over the past few weeks even, um, with some people saying that it should be abandoned and scrapped, um, and other people saying that we should take it all the way and just get it approved and accepted. Um, but I, that's kind of like, that's a matter for the FIG to discuss and potentially vote on in the future, but um, there are a lot of conflicting opinions on where that should go. I forget yeah, whether it's the IETF or someone else, but if they can have uh, IP via carrier pigeon, I think Huggable 8 might be all right. Right, yeah, but this, I mean, let's not forget the uh, decode. Um, what is it? 418? I'm a little teapot. Four eight. That, that's true. Which, but I mean, there's which, a, which there's the teapot candy. is actually implemented in something. I think too yeah, much uh, breath is wasted on this topic, to be honest. Yeah, there, <laughs> I mean, there's a case to be made problem. for saying that a handful of joke RFCs in IETF, thousands of RFCs, is different than one thirteenth of our, IS, our RFCs being uh, jokes. So I mean I I don't really care one way or the other like at a personal level but it's it, it should reach a disposition whatever that disposition the fig decides on is is fine but it should not just sit there forever. Mm -hmm. And this this actually came up at uh, Midwest PHP. Um, so once the abandonment rules get in, uh, it would actually fall under the abandonment rule where it would no longer be uh, a viable PSR. Uh, so either it needs to be ratified before that or we'll just let it fall to the wayside once those new rules come in, is kind of where it sits right now. Jay, Jay Grunder on Twitter uh, just gave a plus one for PSR 8, so there you go. That's from the community. <laughs> uh, so uh, also we haven't talked about, uh, you mentioned, Michael, uh, PSR 12 that was actually going to be deprecating PSR 2, but before, um, I actually do did want to ask about that, but before I do, uh, PSR 1 and 2, both have to deal with coding styles, right? Or are those why are they two different things? It seems like they kind of talk about the same thing. 
So there are separate, di uh, again, full disclosure, I was the, uh, the person leading the charge behind those after Klaus Silvera brought up the idea of having a coding standard in the first place. Uh, originally, they were one document, uh, the, uh, the, and, it, and it failed to pass a vote, I think, either once or twice as a single document. Um, the concern at the time was that coding standards in general were too hot a topic, uh, specifically, I, I, I don't even know if I want to bring up the specific hot topics there, so I won't. Uh, there, are, there are, let's just say there are elements of coding style, coding styles that people become uh, religiously devoted to and will fight, fight, fight about them all the time. Um, it was thought at the time, and, and I disagreed with it at the time, that it would be better for the, the things that were not disagreeable or not potentially disagreeable to be in one document and the things that were potentially disagreeable to be in the other, so that at the very least people could adopt the things that were you know, not disagreeable and then could spout and, and be very angry at the things they were that they thought were disagreeable and not accept that. Um, if but I may... That's um, not to have been the right decision. Yeah, I think I originally came up with splitting them, and um, but it was not just uh, splitting them between things that are have consensus and things that don't. I think, for me, I actually thought that, okay, there's actually some stuff in here that is actually really useful, and I thought and a lot of people with me thought that, um, aside from whether you want to use tabs or spaces, sorry, I'm naming it. Um, <laughs> I was actually part of maybe, I think also uh, a large group of people that felt it's kind of pointless to have the discussion as, at all. And I think um, and um, creating a place for people to have the discussion actually sits in the way of the stuff that I found was actually extremely useful. So my thinking was, let's split up uh, things between PSR1 and PSR2, and PSR1 actually having things that have an effect on people using the library, and PSR2 only stuff has an uh, effect on people uh, maintaining the library. Um, so, and I was thinking in the back of my mind, you know, because it, this failed twice, it's very possible that PSR2 will make it, but then at least we'll have PSR1, which I think is uh, super useful. Um, so, um, in the end, they both made it, um, but I'm also I'm still glad with that split because I think PSR1 is actually something that's quite important. Uh, for people to follow, or PSR2 could be useful, and I think that's you know a good way to describe them. I think that's I think fair. What, I think what PSR2 also did um, is it emphasized that not everyone is expected to use every single standard that, that the FIG produces. Um, the standards are there, and they're created by um, a group of projects um, to say that this is something you can use if you want to, if it's convenient for you. Um, now, a lot of projects now do use PSR2. Um, I think Laravel adopted, adopted it last year um, after previously only using PSR1. Um, Symfony used PSR1 and 2. Um, I'm not sure what Zone Framework do, if I confess. Um, they are, they do use them. Matthew's nodding. Um, yep, 1 and 2. So, but the fact is, is that there are still a lot of projects that don't use PSR2. And the thing is, is that that's absolutely fine. The point of PSR2 was to provide a standard which people go right, I want to have a really small little library, I want to make my project, um, or, you know, a big project, but I don't want to have to spend time writing coding style guides. Like, this is not what I should spend my time on. I should spend my time solving problems and solving, doing interesting coding stuff. I don't want to be telling people where to put their code at curly braces. So they can just say, we use PSR2, problem solved. Um, and it just makes their life so much easier. And if they choose not to use PSR2 and they use, choose to use pair coding style guide or just PSR1 and then just um, have their um, have a file that sort of has their coding style stuff for IDEs, then that's fine too. Um, but it's, it's designed to make life easier. So it's, it's not something that everyone has to use. Um, it's much more important to standardize um, tabs or spaces um, it doesn't matter which one. Like, you know, I don't care if I'm using tabs or spaces. I care that there is a set defined one that is going to be used throughout a project. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm a tabs guy, but like, it doesn't matter. Like, I use PSR2 all the time, which is spaces. And you just have to deal with it. My, my standard does not matter so long as it is used by, as long as people agree on what it is. My dance partner just. The world of config, it's fine. What was that, Samantha? We live in the world of editor config. Like, it's fine. Yeah. Like, you know. My dance so, partner just thought it was the strangest thing um, when I she was I was saying all these people are going back and forth and it's like a Twitter war on this and that and she's like what are they what are they fighting about and I was like um, well one wants to use tabs and the other wants to use spaces and she's like why are they 
what? <laughs> she was like dumbfounded. She's like, well, I, I don't understand. So like a couple weeks later, um, there was like some so two people were going at it on Twitter, and I was like, oh, oh, Heather, check us out. Like they're really they're really going at it. And she was like, was it a ta- are they arguing about tabs and spaces again? <laughs> and I was like, no, it's a different issue. But <laughs> but it was, it's funny that she's just like she's still like she thinks of the BHB community as like very passionate about tabs and spaces, which I mean I guess in in some respects it is. But um, it's just kind of funny to see uh, from from the outside perspective of how kind of ridiculous the argument is sometimes. But but I do want to ask about PSR 12 is that um, I'm assuming, I haven't actually looked into it too much, but I'm assuming it's because we have new syntax in PHP, like in PHP 7. Um, I, I don't actually, was this PHP? Yeah, I think it was PHP 7, like the grouped namespaces syntax and all this other stuff. Um, is that why we we have to kind of go back and look at the coding uh, style? Yeah, uh, specifically uh, things like anonymous classes. How uh, should those be defined, and what uh, you know? What are the style guidelines around those? Uh, also, the return type hints uh, is another big one because uh, how you know is there a space before and after the, the separator uh, and that sort of thing. So yeah, there's a few different syntax issues that are certainly not explicitly covered by PSI one and two that uh, we'd like to iron out at this point. So um, it seems like four... history is sorry, Michael. Um, uh, it's kind of history repeating itself a bit. Um, we created PSR like one or two because uh, like the pair coding standards were no longer like updated and relevant, so we had to create a more relevant and current one. And now, because we have PHP 7 with additions, we have to have something that matches the, the, the up-to-date uh, syntax for the language, so a la PSR 12. And, and if, in the future, if more shiny things come in the language that we have to have some kind of, kind of consistency of, then that will, you know, extend PSR 12 or, or you know, uh, complement it as well. So it's just a repeatable pattern that we'll see as more, more shiny things and more, more changes come into PHP as it as it matures. Yeah. So I was the um, editor of PSR 12 um, until uh, December um, of last year, at which point I stepped down to move on to a uh, secretary role. Um, but Essentially, there were, yeah, there were two main parts of it. One was PHP 7 functionality. So things like if you actually use return type hints, then most coding um, uh, coding uh, uh, styles, stiffers, whatever, um, they would actually reject anything if it used return type declarations or stuff like that because it simply didn't know how to handle it. Um, so the idea is, is it will cover things like that, but it also does um, a couple of things. So it clar- clarifies a couple of things from PSR 2. Um, so, for example, the errata for um, PSR, uh, PSR2 isn't actually binding. Um, so things like that are actually integrated into PSR12. Um, and it also, there are a few things, that are, are, um, slight inconsistencies um, that have just been fixed but aren't backwards um, compatible breaking. Um, so, yeah, the idea is, is cleaning up a few things from PSR2 uh, that we discovered a few years after um, it had gone through and the main PHP 7 stuff. But there's also PHP 5 features in there as well, so uh, grouping namespaces and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think of other things off the top of my head. Um, ternary operator, I think, potentially. Um, but, yeah, so it's not just PHP 7, but it's also PHP 5.x stuff that was added a bit later as well. So you said it would deprecate PS- PSR 2, um, I'm curious if you wanted to combine PSR one and two, or for the same reasons that you'd men- that, that Paul and and Everett uh, mentioned before, if if you want to keep those separate. Yeah, you can't you can't like merge things as set in stone. It's a standard that lives. It says concrete, right? Uh, people are still using PSR one. Maybe if ta- ten years from now, you can't delete shit that people are relying on. So you've got to just keep that keep that static and move forward. PS, PSR1 um, isn't going to be changed. It isn't going to be deprecated. Um, PSR12 will um, only if it will uh, deprecate and um, replace PSR2. Um, and just like PSR2 does, it will require compliance with PSR1. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing changing about PSR1. Cool. Staying in there. Well, uh, we actually have almost talked about every single PSR except for two of them. PSR 11, which is the container interface, which I think Paul uh, Jones, you you actually are coordinator of that one. I'm. I think I'm. Uh, I think I am coordinator on that one. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the idea. How, the idea behind that is, and I'm I'm blanking on their names now. I think it's Matthias Novak and oh, and someone else again. I I, I don't recall their names. Please forgive me, guys. Um, it's uh, Matthew um, and Matthew Napoli um, and David. 
Matthew, uh, David, and Jeremy. Excellent. I thank you for that. Um, the so these guys looked out on the PHP world and saw lots of different uh, dependency injection container implementations, uh, and they realized that there are essentially two things that all these containers had in common: uh, checking to see if the container has a particular service, and then if it does, getting that service out of the container, uh, ostensibly to be used at a boot, pro boot process or at boot time. Um, and so realizing that there was no that th those things were common, but that they weren't there was no formal standard for them, uh, went on their own to create something called container interop and involved a lot of container authors in that discussion in container interop. Uh, myself included. Uh, I, I think Matthew was in there. There's a lot of other people on there. And as a result of those discussions came up with container interop interface, which is essentially two methods, get and has, and then a, uh, the idea of having a subcontainer that if, so that if, a, a, if the container you're asking for doesn't have a particular service, it can then ask a subcontainer or a follow-on container to see if it's got that service. Uh, after having done that work, they then presented it to the FIG for a uh, for you know to become a PSR through the FIG. Uh, after it was introduced, uh, there re there was a little bit of discussion. There hasn't been a ton of discussion on it. Uh, one of the purposes, you know, and although I am the coordinator on it, I am not the mind behind it. Uh, so it would be up to the uh, the editors on that to uh, to further that discussion if they feel like it. Cool. Well, um, the last PSR that we haven't talked about, actually, Everett and Matthew, you guys are um, coordinator and sponsor of this one, PSR 13, the Hypermedia Links PSR. So how, why would you need a PSR for, for links? It sounds simple, right? Although, Matthew, I, I feel like in our uh, in episode 22, we talked about how ridiculously, insanely hard it was to actually um, deal with links when it came to PSR 7. I think that's what we talked about. I can't remember. Yeah, oh, we URIs. talked about your eyes. Yeah, your eyes. Your eyes. Yes. Yes. I uh, yeah. The it came about because uh, you know, when we're doing PHP anymore, more often than not, we're doing APIs, and there's a whole bunch of different formats you can use. There's XML. Um, you can be using JSON. You can be using uh, any of a number of these things, and each of these actually has different dialects, even right? Because if I go into HAL, it could be you know something like I'm using joined in, where they make up their own uh, format. It could be using HAL. It could be using uh, JSON RPC specification. There's or JSON API specification. There's all these different ones, but they all have a way of representing links in some way, shape, or form. And typically, with a link, you have uh, some sort of destination, the actual target of the link, and uh, also some metadata about what is this what is the context of this link. Uh, in some cases, they might be templated. Uh, there's a number of different things that are standardized uh, in the IETF, but we don't have a way of actually uh, describing that in PHP nor describing collections of such links that uh, you might have as part of the document. Uh, so that's what the whole idea about it is, is to basically make that a little bit simpler, have a standard way of doing that, which will actually simplify the lives of library authors who are doing these um, serialization formats. Yeah, not just serialization, but it's it's a way to. Um, um, sorry, I just he heard my own echo. Um, that confused me a little bit. But uh, um, so basically, by by creating a link PSR, you uh, you create an interface of how a link should work, and it also allows multiple libraries or framework authors to uh, send these types of links back and forward and have a way to type on the on the, that type of uh, that data type, and that's really. I think the, the biggest benefit of it is um, it allows you to type on links, uh, which is something we don't have right now. And I think I kind of hope, like, it's a very simple one in a sense, and I think uh, it's a very, um, um, I don't think it will cause a lot of drama in that sense, and I kind of hope that maybe this is also, like, a good example of, um, yeah, other sort of PSRs that we see in the future that just describe a very simple piece of data, um, and that's it, and that's, um, I think it will just help us uh, interrupt a lot better. For these types of things, but it's very, very cool. abstract. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> well, Larry Garfield's actually the editor for PSR 13. He's been the editor for the Hugs interface and a lot of PSR 6, I think. So he's he's been pretty involved in. He's just like the editing 
he just he is the editor. It seems like he's just like <laughs> doing a lot of different, work a lot of hard work on that. So that's cool. Um, actually, I wanted to take a quick pause here to um, we got to wrap it up eventually. Um, I know we're kind of running on time. There's still like a, a lot of things I want to hit up, but uh, Paul Dragunas needs to go speak in front of a huge, big bunch of people that give a great talk. So Paul, I want to give you an opportunity to give a shameless plug before you head out. Um, okay, fair enough. Um, Shameless plugs, not really shameless plugs, but things I want to, I'm, I'm passionate about are interoperability, have been for some time before the FIG was an idea, and still working on that, on, on specific goals using the project that I use to work on them, which is the PPI framework, that's uh, ppi.io is the URL, and we work on things there such as, can, so for the past three years we've had container interoperability between Zen Framework and Symfony, for example, so we use that project to create PSRs before they exist and before they're actually in the fig and use that in production um, for a, a few years in advance and then eventually uh, either something comes up with the idea or we bring some experience back to the fig. So if anybody likes the idea of interoperability and likes a playground to do things in advance and without this, the kind of formal structure that you need in the fig, then uh, get in touch and check out the project. So that's really all I like to say about that. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us, and good luck with your talk. Cheers. Catch you later. See you, buddy. Bye. Cheers. So we officially talked about all the PSRs, and um, I'm, I'm curious uh, out the PSR... Uh, PSRs in general have been kind of hugely popular and, and adopted by many, many projects, and I, I know that the, the framework interop group is, is what FIG stands for. Um, so... Was that the original intention that, that all these other projects would start adopting the PSRs too, or was that sort of a surprise that like there was going to be such a big community backing of all the PSRs? If you look at the... So as I said, I was having a look at the initial emails. If you have a look at the initial emails, it was literally just a bunch of... Oh, we might have lost Michael. Lose him? Down the internet portal. Uh, Oh. oh, there you are. <clears throat> Michael, we lost you for about um, a good 10 seconds or so. Or a All right. I don't know how you... Uh, if you look at the original emails, is the last thing I heard. <laughs> um, yes. So if you have a look at the um, earlier emails on the Figma, on the, well, what was then the PHP Sanders mailing list, um, it was a bunch of guys who um, met up at a conference and were like, we should meet up at some more conferences. Um, and then they decided, let's have a mailing list so we can discuss in between. Um, so from having a look at that, it seemed to be very much kind of a thing that they just wanted to discuss between themselves. Um, I think there was... Um, Matthew would actually probably be able to say who the different founders were, but I believe Brett Bieber was there, uh, Stefan was there, Matthew was there, um, Cal was the first ever voted in member, I think. Um, who else am I missing? I've got a list David. right here. Uh, David, David Zolzonki, Travis Weisgut, myself, Stefan Koopman-Scott, Matthew Weirofini, and then a bunch of guys from Pair, Brett Beaver, David Collier, Heller, Helgi, Thormor, Thor Bjornsson, and uh, the previously mentioned Travis Swicegood. Was uh, actually... that Nate the belly there? <laughs> huh? Was Which that one? Nate there? Nate. Yeah, Nate was there, man. Okay, you didn't say his name, so I got a little oh, confused. Oh, did I not say his name? Nate Omni, my bad. Um, <laughs> I was concentrating on spinning up to Helgi, Thormor, Thor Bjornsson. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually David Collier who... Uh, and, and Travis Weisgood, who are the ones that I, er, that I recall anyway, who uh, who had the idea at the time and corralled us all into the room. So it, yeah. it definitely sounds Collier like was the one that pulled me into it. So yeah, they were they were the instigators. So it definitely sounds like it was a very specific um, sort of addressing a very specific problem, but it seems to have. Uh, the, the problems that they were solving were actually solving the problems of these other projects that weren't necessarily framework projects. Um, what is the I, I guess I've seen some uh, some of the non-framework developers complain that the FIG develops standards that are either overly complex or overly simplistic or whatever, and 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 I've seen the response from the FIG being like, well, this is the framework interrupt group, and it doesn't really apply to like all you know all of PHP. Um, is this mindset changing from within the FIG as far as um, considering things for the future, or do, do all the FIG members even agree with this mindset? No, no. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
No, there's no there's no official stance. Like what what you hear is you know just people having opinions about that, and I think we all have different opinions and and things we want to achieve with this group, and I kind of disagree even with um, saying that you know the group was first just a couple of guys in a room wanting to work better together because that you know that might be might have been true for that initial meeting, but then you know a mailing list gets created that's called PHP standard. So clearly, you know I think some people must have had the idea already that you know this could actually be useful for a larger group. And um, um, but I think there's nothing wrong with that. And I think you know if you and I can definitely see that you know if you call something a PHP standard, that will call you know that you get a lot of criticism for that. And that criticism is still happening today because you know we, we're still PHP fix is still considered as a place to come up with these standards. Whether or not you want to call them standards, that's pretty much the role they fulfill. And um, you know for any any sort of thing um, that you that we put out, there's going to be a lot of opinions about. And for every, every so even small thing, obvious thing, there's going to be someone who's very upset about that and disagree with uh, the approach. And um, whether that's steps or spaces or you know something a little bit more important. And um, yeah, so so I think um, um, I, I think what we still hope to do is to create you know stuff that actually uh, makes the PHP community better as a whole. Uh, and I kind of hope that we the, the fig continues to improve itself also structurally to make it even easier to do that and actually you know take away some of these pain points because I definitely think it's possible and I think um, um, some of the criticism also I think comes a little bit from maybe people look at this as a little bit of an elite sort of group and um, yeah um, so I yeah but there's no single opinion I think when it comes to this. I, mean, I think that holds true for a lot of things in the thing, you know, there, there's no one opinion. Um. You know, when I started, um, you know, down the path, you know, it really was wanting to have some way of uh, making interoperability better just between the member projects, because at the time, that it was just frameworks, right? And then Composer went and said, hey, this auto-loading thing is pretty cool, and what if we were to add some packaging around that? and uh, commoditize the auto-loading, and all of a sudden we got to see that, you know, this one specification we had had this huge explosion. And now, it's not just frameworks. I would argue that frameworks are, you know, really, in many ways, dying. We've got all these, uh, you know, the great packages out there. I can go and find exactly the package I need for exactly my use case almost every time, and it may not be the one that came with my framework. So now it becomes an issue of I want to make sure that the code I'm writing and the code that this other person is writing and the code that this other person is writing is all going to work and play together. And at this point now, it isn't any longer just you know, the representative projects. It is a greater PHP ecosystem, for better or for worse. And that's a, the, the path I feel has been taken. Um, and I know, again, you know, not everybody uh, agrees that way. The question is, do we embrace that or do we continue to say, you know, no, you know, we're not doing it all? I went into PSR7 specifically with the idea is I think this is going to be great for the greater PHP ecosystem, not necessarily that it's going to be just for the frameworks. Yes, a lot of the frameworks are involved and uh, are affected by this, but I really was thinking this is something, this is a direction I would like to see the PHP ecosystem head, and uh, that was why it was important to me. So, yeah, I, I think that transition is happening. I, it's a question of whether we as a group are going to embrace that or if we're going to say, you know what, no, it's just about us. Uh, I, feel that, I feel that. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I insist, please. I feel that if you if you look at the amount of attention that PSRs get from the 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 the, the, commuter, the larger community, people that are not involved in framework or library development, uh, there there is a hunger out there for a group of of smart people to think through these um, overarching architectural considerations and come up with recommendations, like we've thought through this and this is what we th we think is the right way to approach this particular problem. Um, I think that that has value in any programming community and I don't know if the FIG is the right body to become that, um, but I mean, the fact that, that PSR2 has become something, for example, that basically every PHP developer is intimately familiar with and, and PSR7 is, is something that you know, you actively saw people very, very excited about as it was going through its process being developed and, and, and voted on. Like people, people want a standards body. They 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 want these standards um, out there. They want to kind of see the community come around a particular way of solving a problem, um, and get behind that. I think that's encouraging, and and that's all I really wanted to to say. I think that there is a hunger for it, whether or not Fig uh, ends up filling that role. Well, I think there's a hunger for from some people. I mean, 
I, I no longer speak for the fig. I do not pretend to, but I can explain to you where where I was coming from. I was one of the ones that helped develop the messaging, hey, we're just developing things for our own bodies, because I was on the mailing list early on. I was at, um, I think it was Tech 10, where uh, we were in um, DevHell, Tech 10 or Tech 11, where we were at DevHell uh, live podcast, and it just became a dog pile on FIG. And I'm sitting in there, and I finally had to stand up and say, look, I'm your community member, representative. You know, if you've got problems, come talk to me. People want standards, but they want their standards. And the only way, or the best way I can illustrate this is um, after one of the recent votes that I, one of the last ones I was involved in, I actually had somebody come up to me at a conference, a note, if I, if I told you this person's name, you would know them, and say to me, I don't like the vote you made. I disagree with you. You're not representing me, so I'm going to challenge you for your seat. At which point I was like, you know, if you really want to take this on, I'm fine. But people don't want an overarching standard. They want you to implement their standards and the ones that they're comfortable with, and you're just not going to please everybody. And so if the FIG does stand in or um, step into that role, and I have no problem with the FIG um, stepping into that role and saying we're going to define standards because there's some um, people infinitely smarter than me on that that can figure these things out. But if they're going to do it, be prepared to take a lot of crap, and it, it's got to be much more of a unified front. It can't simply be, well, there's a lot of answers to each question. If you're going to do this, you're going to have to say, this is the standard for our community. So I'm going to follow up on both from Cal and from Samantha. Uh, uh, you're, you're, first of all, Cal, you're right. People want their standards. I was thinking exactly that as you said it. In, in a way, a lot of what people want is not standards, but validation. What I am doing is the right thing, and I don't have to change because I'm already doing the right thing. And if you're doing something different than you're telling, than what I'm doing, then who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? Uh, there is a lot of that in the world. Um, the 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 other thing that I hear both from Samantha, from Cal, from other people, frankly, is that what we need are a bunch of smart people to figure out these problems. Uh, I am on record as saying more than once that smart is overrated. Uh, it's not enough to be smart. You have to actually know things. One of the ways of knowing things is to actually go through the process of building stuff and then come back with your report on what the what it was like building it, what your problems were, and speak from a basis of knowledge, not just of predictive rationality, that is, trying to figure out in advance what it ought to be or what you think it ought to be. Uh, that was the number one reason for uh, the, the membership requirement, such as it was, in FIG at its origin for, was for the members to actually have a project. That is, they have to have skin in the game. Um, so it's not enough in my mind to say we need smart people figuring this stuff out. We need people who have skin in the game. People who have actually tried it and failed and then come back to try a different way or they've tried and succeeded and this is how it worked. Um, so having a, a standards body of any sort uh, I think depends on having people who are involved in that way, not merely people who are smart. Uh, I have a much longer rant about that kind of thing, but I'm going to let it go at that. <laughs> not, not a rant. If you've got slides, it's a conference talk. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I do want to follow up by saying one thing. The person that I'm talking about, there's a very good chance they're watching this, and I, I, I am no mean mean to demean what you said to me. Um, I, I was just using you to illustrate the point that you can't you can't please everybody. Um, you know, I, I apologize if I've offended this person. It was me. You offended me, Cal. Oh, yeah, then I won't apologize. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, I do want to wrap it up uh, with maybe just looking really quickly. Like, we take a brief glimpse at this next question, and this is the last thing we'll end on, because I, I talked with, uh, I think, Michael and Larry about maybe even doing an entire episode about this later on, uh, and that is where the fig is going. Where are we going with this? Where's this boat sailing to? And we might um, dive into more detail, so I don't want to get into too many. I don't want to give too many spoilers around because I know it's still kind of like up in the air and you're still kind of like feeling things out but what are just some can you give us Michael any sneak peeks into what you and Larry are, are kind of working on behind the scenes I, I could but I might have to kill you all um, <laughs> that's my um, line man <laughs> <laughs> um, so 
the I can talk about it um, because some of it has already been posted to the mailing list by uh, Larry. Some very sketchy details, um, and it's we're expanding upon that a lot at the moment. Um, Larry is doing a great job of actually hashing it out and writing it, um, and I'm sitting there um, on Slack saying, "I think this is wrong. I think this is wrong." Um, but essentially, uh, at the moment, we have the member projects. And they are they vote on every specification. Um, they vote on every membership request, etc. Um, but there are some problems with that. So quorum can be quite hard to achieve at times um, because there are a lot of member projects that are not really particularly involved or engaged within the fig anymore. Um, or they might turn up for big votes. Um, for example, um, PSR seven vote, um, final acceptance vote had a huge voting turnout. Um, because it was it was receiving press that everyone knew that it was going on kind of thing. Um, but for a membership vote, um, there was one for PHP spec, and I'm pretty sure um, most of the people who are probably listening to us have heard of PHP spec. Um, but the PHP spec membership vote actually didn't achieve a quorum, uh, which is, to be honest, quite frankly embarrassing. Um, so we also have the problem in that um, you've got a lot of people voting on specifications that have no clue as to what is in it. Um, you, not every single project representative in the FIG has a stake um, or knows about async, um, asynchronous uh, stuff within PHP, for example. So you then get to this point where you've got a bunch of people, um, some of whom uh, don't really ever really turn up or are particularly engaged, um, and they're voting on things that a lot of them don't know about or they don't care about. Um, and then you have a smaller group of people who um, care about specific things. So, for example, um, Matthew um, obviously has, a, working with Zend, has a big stake in things like PSR7. Um, and he has a lot of subject knowledge in that area. Um, you've got individuals like the um, different caching libraries like Doctrine or um, I think there's uh, and Stash, for example, that care a lot about a caching interface. So the idea of a new structure would actually have uh, three elements to the fig, um, or potentially four if you include the secretaries, um, something separate as well. So you'd have a much more formalized working group structure in that when, um, at the moment, we have an editor, a coordinator, and a sponsor, and then a whole bunch of other people who are just uh, authors and whatnot. The idea of that working group structure is that anyone who um, knows about that PSR, people who care about that thing, people who have particular stakes in it, um, would want to be a part of that working group. So um, for PSR7, that might be um, some different middlewares and stuff. People that do uh, deal with a lot with HTTP stuff. Um, then you might have, for example, the caching, you might, you'd have the different caching libraries. Um, then you'd have some sort of core committee. Um, <laughs> um, some shameless plugs from Cal already going on. Um, so then you'd have a core committee, and the specifications would then go through them. Um, and the idea of that core committee wouldn't be to say the specification is correct. The specification handles all, all the stuff that it needs to to do with HTTP. Um, that would be the job of the working group. The core committee um, would be responsible for things like making sure that there are two working implementations that we discussed earlier um, with Eva. Um, it would be responsible for um, making sure that the specification had sort of matured a bit um, and was in a good place for it to be, and kind of like a final quality assurance that this is a good FIG specification. And then the basis of the FIG will still remain being those member projects, um, but having that core committee also incorporates um, that committee, uh, the, like, sorry, not committee, community element that Cal was going, um, talking about earlier. So instead of having one community at large representative, the idea is that this core committee would represent the community and the member projects. Um, so whilst the member projects give the FIG um, its weight, kind of, um, it also has uh, that community input, um, and they as, a, they, as a larger group, represent the community's views and the member projects' views. Um, and whether you consider that, and whether that's on an equal footing or not, because a lot of people that are part of a Drupal community um, are part of the wider community, um, and, they, they, and therefore they are part of that member project. So the idea is trying to rebalance things between the community and member projects, while still making sure that member projects have a very important role. Um, so, for example, elections of the core committee um, and secretaries, um, but also making sure that we use that specialist knowledge and we have people who know about stuff voting on stuff that they know about. Um, 
so that's kind of a very brief outline um, of where the FIG is potentially going with this restructure, um, but that's not been voted on or even officially proposed yet. Um, so it's still got a lot of fleshing out to go. But um, that's a that's a giant sneak peek. I appreciate that. That's cool. That's yeah. it's cool to see <laughs> kind of like yeah, it's cool to see some 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 things about like how it's how it is morphing and uh, it'll be exciting to see how that actually plays out. Um, and because I know as a as a gov- kind of a governing body, like you know, lots of people have a say in, in how that how that ends going. So I'm sure it'll look very different, you know, at, on the end result. But uh, we'll definitely talk about having an episode about that when it starts getting fleshed out a little bit more and more people get input and stuff. And um, yeah, it's exciting to see that stuff. Uh, we gotta wrap this thing up. I know there's there's still more stuff I wanted to talk about. Uh, there's so much stuff I want to talk about. But oh well, um, this has been an awesome discussion. But we need to wrap this up with the developer shout out. And this is a segment that recognizes a developer for just being awesome in the community. Because a lot of developers just give so much, and a lot of this stuff we're like committing code or or doing like running meetup groups and stuff. And sometimes it's kind of a thankless job. So this is an opportunity to say thank you to somebody who's been doing a lot in the community. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna send them a fifty dollar Amazon gift card and the Amazon gift card is sponsored by Laracast.com and if you've never been there it's amazing you got to check it out Laracast.com it's a bunch of screencasts of all these great things all these things you can do in PHP it teaches you how to do everything from testing to how to even use your IDE if you want to learn Vim or PHP Storm or uh, Sublime Text or anything you wanted to, to learn on that end and it takes you step by step it doesn't assume that you know everything there's there's great ones for like total new beginners and there's really great advanced tutorials a lot of them are uh, centered around the Laravel framework but um, a lot of it is just general PHP knowledge and general knowledge um, and it's just awesome uh, so I highly recommend checking that out and so thank you Laracast for sponsoring the developer shout out and for this episode I asked the panel who would be a great candidate for the developer shout out and the and the panel nominated Mr. Adam Culp. So, Cal, why why did the panel nominate Adam? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. First of all, Adam represents, or he is a member of the FIG, and he represents the IBM I um, framework. Second of all, he does an awful lot for the community. He runs two user groups. I'm about to drag him into a third one up here in Jupiter, Florida. Um, but, and he also um, runs Sunshine PHP. Is that, yeah, you can see the little right there on the elephant's butt, um, <laughs> Sunshine PHP, uh, which is um, one of the good, there you go, Samantha's got one too. Uh, one of my favorite conferences, um, mainly because he keeps asking me to speak and I have no idea why. So this is not actually payback for allowing me or allowing me to speak this year. This is you know from the heart. Um, Adam, we appreciate all you do. Yes, thank you, Adam, for all you do. I've been to Sunshine and it was one of my favorite PHP conferences. Not, um, not to... to, to to, to offend anybody else who has a PHP conference, but it's one of the top ones. Uh, and it, I was unfortunately unable to go this year because uh, a couple of emergencies popped up. But um, I was really, really, really bummed. But um, definitely, um, all the work that you put in, Adam, uh, to the PHP community is not unnoticed. So um, I'll be hitting you up to try to get your snail mail address and send you this $50 Amazon gift card, as well as a very poorly handwritten uh, thank you note, uh, handwritten by me. I think my dance partner even offered to write these things for me because they're just so my penmanship is just so awful. Uh, but I'll 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 try I'll try to get better at it. Just spend a little bit more time on it. Um, actually, let's let's wrap this thing up officially with um, some shameless plugs. And we uh, I'm gonna just go down the list here in no particular order. Like we started with Cal. Do you have anything that you want to promote? Other, I mean, I know you've been promoting Sunshine, but surely you got. You got more than that, right? <laughs> oh, obviously, yes. Um, I'm going to promote Day Camp for Developers coming up April 22nd. That's a Friday. It's an online conference. I have five wonderful speakers lined up to talk to you about modern PHP. If you um, are doing PHP and want to keep your skills up to the top level, join us. Um, you can get more information at daycamp, the number four, developers.com. Excellent. Chris, Tankersley, you got anything that you want to promote? Uh, sure. Uh, at the end of last year, I came out with a Docker book uh, for PHP developers. Uh, so if you are looking at Docker and you're interested and not sure how to get it into your workflow, uh, leanpub.com slash docker for devs is a great uh, way to get into Docker and, and figure out what it does and, and how to get it working with your application. And then, of course, if you're looking for a nice static site generator, you should always check out Sculpin. Nice. Everett, you got anything that you want to promote? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I started freelancing since last year, so hire me. That's it. 
<laughs> that's that's legit. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. What about you, Matthew? Uh, we just released uh, a little over a month ago uh, first stable version of Expressive, which is built on top of PSR7, providing middleware. We also are using the eventual container interop. Uh, we're using that internally and trying to basically glue together a bunch of the standards into a reliant and uh, performant uh, middleware stack. Corporate chill. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, Michael, you got anything you want to promote? Um, yeah, so uh, two things, actually. Uh, one is PHP South Coast, which is um, a nice little conference, um, essentially on the seaside um, in the UK um, on the 11th of June, and early bird tickets are open uh, at the moment. Um, and it's a one day. Uh, tickets are about ninety pounds, I think. So quite cheap for a conference as well. Um, great if you're working on a budget and whatnot. Um, and the other thing I wanted to plug is kind of more a general thing. Um, so I work on PHPV. Um, I'm on the management team. And so I'm not going to plug PHPV, but I what I do want to plug is I want everyone to uh, go and have a look at a project that you haven't looked at in a while. Some sort of legacy code. Uh, whether that's WordPress or PHP or something, something you think that you last looked at it and you thought this is really awful, and just go and have a look at it and see if it's improved because it might surprise you. Um, you know, Drupal 8 uh, is just you know to, obviously everyone knows about this now, but you know it's integrating Symfony components. PHP is done the same, um, so I want to plug all legacy projects and um, hope that people will go out there and have a look and give them a second chance. Excellent, and that actually might tie into Paul. <laughs> this promotion, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, in fact, it does. The, the the thing that I've been hawking for the past two years at this point is a book called my, my book called uh, Modernizing Legacy Applications in PHP. Um, if you've got a lot of us, so a lot of this talk has been about setting standards uh, between projects, working the frameworks. But for good or bad, a lot of people in their daily work lives are stuck with code bases that are, and I'm not kidding, 12 to 14 years old. Uh, these are legacy code bases based on, on pretty much whatever definition you want. They're include-oriented, not procedural or class-oriented or object-oriented. They run by includes. And every time you include and include and include, you have no idea what's touching what. So anytime you try to fix one thing in one place, something else breaks because everything else is global. If that's the kind of situ situation you're in, if you've got a spaghetti mess of code that you don't know how to deal with, and you dread going into work every day trying to deal with it, uh, there is a way out. Uh, this Again, the book is called Modernizing Legacy Applications in PHP. Go to mlaphp.com. When you go through the book, you will get a step-by-step -step list of instructions, highly detailed, on how to move from this horrible, awful spaghetti mess of code to something that is auto-loaded, dependency-injected, unit-tested, layer-separated, and front-controlled. Uh, I'm not going to say that it's going to make your code perfect, but your life will improve dramatically as you imp as you apply these step-by-step -step refactorings uh, to improve the quality of your code base as you go. I kind of wish your middle name were Brian, so your middle so your initials would be PBJ. <laughs> <laughs> Just a random insert there. <laughs> awesome. So Samantha. You're the last one I see on my on my list here. So, what are you what are you promoting? You're muted though. That's going to make it hard to promote. It's almost 80 degrees here in DC today. Um, so it's almost summertime, which means that uh, Girls Who Code summer immersion programs are going to be opening up across the country. Um, there's more ci more cities this year than there have ever been before. So like Atlanta, Austin, Boston, Chicago, um, LA, uh, Newark. Um, New York City, there's a couple in the SF Bay area, Seattle, uh, and of course DC. Um, all of these groups are looking for people to come and work as teachers, to come and work as TAs, and to volunteer um, as um, as guest speakers. I, I, I've guessed, uh, I've, I've appeared as a guest speaker at a, at a Girls Who Code event. It's a great way to reach out to um, amazingly brilliant, motivated uh, sophomore and junior uh, high school students who are interested in joining the industry. Um, and a lot of these uh, a lot of these young ladies are really like they're they're coming 40, 50 miles every morning and on a bus early, early in the morning to go to this this um to go to this school during the summer and and be exposed to all different things in tech. So it's a really really cool program. Um, and if you have the time and inclination, please check it out. Girlswhocode.com. Excellent. 
Well, we've got a couple of cool episodes coming up down uh, the line. <laughs> coming up down the line, uh, the first, I think, the next one we're going to do is staying relevant, uh, which is all about like kind of how do we stay on top of the t continuously changing technologies that uh, we have to deal with as web developers. Um, also, asynchronous PHP. We're going to be looking at some. We mentioned async um, and. Um, we're going to be talking all about async stuff. We talked about it a little bit in the past, but we've got a whole episode dedicated uh, to it pretty, pretty soon. Um, and two more cool episodes that are a little further down the line, but uh, are pretty exciting. Uh, one is we're going to be talking all about HTTP2. If you've never heard of it, it's going to be changing the way we do things. It's, 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 it's quite different than HTTP 1.1 that we've been so familiar with. And front-end with Vue.js, uh, which is a really cool uh, front-end framework for... Uh, it's in JavaScript. We don't really have any Java, many JavaScript episodes, but we eke them in every once in a while because as PHP developers, we kind of have to be JavaScript developers at the same time, most of the time. So it's uh, this is a really cool framework I've been using on the, the little... Uh, project that we've talked about on the podcast before. So we want to dive in a little deeper on that. If you have something you'd like to share about, uh, some kind of topic um, that PHP, nerd, uh, PHP nerds care about, definitely hit me up. I'm uh, Sammy K on Twitter, or you can go to phproundtable.com. There's a form that says, hey, I want to join the roundtable, or hey, I got a topic idea. So I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. I would like to thank Cal, Chris, Everett, Matthew, Michael, Paul Jones, Paul Dragunas, and Samantha for joining this discussion, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Bye.